the community and we're, I don't know, we're really psyched to be able to share some of this and hopefully see how it's relevant for your work. Um, so just very brief about us. Um, we, Adam and I both work with a company called Grid Impact. Um, we are a collective of researchers and designers that sit all around the world, uh, six continents. And our focus is on designing products and services that work for the excluded. So that could be financially excluded or others. A lot of our work is in financial inclusion, um, but we also do design and research work in water sanitation hygiene, alternative energy, education, uh, and the health space. Most of our work focuses on Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East. Um, although increasingly we are doing more and more work here in the United States, where Adam and I both, uh, both reside. Um, and I think that speaks to perhaps the state of affairs here in the U.S. Um, but our, our focus is always on social impact work uh, and figuring out how to design products and services that really work for people who live uh, in poverty or in um, marginalized communities. So what we're going to share with you today, um, Adam and I are going to split up the presentation um, because we both have different areas of expertise. So my background is in uh, behavioral research, behavioral design, so I'm actually I'm actually an economist by training, and my specialty is in understanding how people behave, how they use things or don't use things, how they take actions or don't take actions. And Adam is actually a user experience designer, uh, interaction designer. So he's the one who built, actually, the wireframes that we'll share with you today. Um, and I think he's still just logging in and registering, but he'll be joining us in just a moment. Um, so I'm going to share with you just a bit of the introduction to the project and some of our, our research in this, in this topic, uh, and then Adam will walk you through the output, which, were, uh, which was this design toolkit focusing on a set of transaction flows, wireframes, visual language, et cetera, that can be used for smartphone apps uh, in the mobile money space in Pakistan. Um, and I will just do a quick um, shout out that this work was just recently um, profiled and used in a new deliverable that Ed, I'll make sure I share with you so you can share with the, the group. Um, but we, I just wrote a publication for SEGA titled Smartphones and Mobile Money, Principles for UI UX Design. It's the first iteration, it's a work in progress but we essentially came up with 21 principles for UX UI design and it was largely based on this work that we'll share with you today from the Pakistan project. So I don't yet see Adam but I'm going to go ahead and get started and hope that he uh, he joins us in a moment. Um, and hopefully, can everyone um, see my screen? I have, um, I have the chat screen open on my other screen so if you have um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, uh, and I can certainly uh, try and respond to those questions throughout the presentation. Um, but if anyone cannot see the PDF presentation, please let me know in that chat function. Okay, yeah, we can see your presentation right now, Alex. And then Adam has the link. He should hopefully be on any moment. So. Great, and he and I are on... Um, on Skype together, so I can uh, make sure he, he gets on. Um, so as I mentioned, we work with a firm called Grid Impact. Um, we use a hybrid approach, a methodology called re behavioral research and design. It's equal parts behavioral science and human-centered design or user-centered design. And I think you'll see a little bit of both of those uh, influences in this presentation today. So we were hired by a company in Pakistan called Karandaz, and Karandaz is focused on promoting financial inclusion in the Pakistani uh, market. They have a particular focus in digital financial services, and they had a really interesting hypothesis um, that was very specific to the Pakistani market, but I think very broadly replicable and relevant uh, beyond Pakistan. And their hypothesis is that as smartphones become more and more popular, and especially as low-cost smartphones are entering 
uh, different emerging markets around the world. Um, there's actually a $30 smartphone currently available in Pakistan. Um, more and more people at the bottom of the pyramid will be able to have access to and use, uh, use smartphones. And so smartphone applications will likely become a very relevant and important channel for the mobile money space. And Karandas' hypothesis is that how those apps are designed will have a large influence on people's uptake and usage of mobile financial services in the future. So they hired us, uh, Grid Impact, and like I said, we're a design firm that also does a kind of behavioral research. They hired us to come up with um, the user interface and user experience design uh, recommendations for what smartphone apps in Pakistan for mobile money should look like if we were to prioritize and target low income, lower literate email users. So know that all of the work we're, we're talking about today is really trying to focus on the base of the pyramid, also female users and lower literate individuals. Um, we did make a decision to design an app that would be used for the mass market, um, but we were particularly interested in how to include those that are currently excluded from the market. Uh, Adam, welcome. Uh, I gave a bit of an intro already, so I'm just going to jump right in. Okay, great. Um, Thanks. Cool. So I'm going to just kind of blow through some of the methodology so that we can get to um, some of the insights, but just wanted to highlight three steps that were used during our research phase of this project. We actually did a fairly comprehensive competitive audit of other smartphone mobile money applications from key markets around the world, as well as looking at the available apps uh, used in the Pakistani market. Um, and we, all of this is public, so we'll make sure we share this deck with you. There's a micro site where it's all available. Um, and this competitive audit is also available uh, online um, as a public good. Um, but we wanted to really get a sense of the local context in Pakistan, as well as what was happening globally uh, in terms of trends in smartphone app, uh, mobile money smartphone app designs uh, from contexts like India, Nigeria, the US, and other markets. That competitive audit helped us just understand what some of the global trends were. And we also conducted a series of stakeholder interviews focused on the Pakistani market to really understand what some of the needs are, the business needs are of the providers in the Pakistani market and how they see both the target segment we were looking at, lower income, lower literate female customers, as well as how they were envisioning uh, smartphone apps to be utilized in the mobile money space going forward since it's a fairly new, uh, a new effort in the Pakistani market. And then finally, and probably the most important aspect of our approach on this Pakistan work was that we, we conducted a series of interviews, both with mobile money customers, current customers, former customers, and actually a few non-users as well, people who are not currently using mobile money, as well as um, uh, mobile money agents. So we actually did a, a series of interviews with agents. And our goal with these interviews was just to understand how people currently view mobile money services, how they currently use mobile money services, what phones and what uh, devices are they using to access mobile money. In the Pakistani market, OTC, over the counter, is a highly utilized channel for mobile money. So there's, there's far less independent use in Pakistan than in other markets. So we really wanted to understand why that was the case and how we might be able to leverage that uh, in the design of a smartphone app. Um, once we had a good understanding of the market uh, and user needs and desires, we were able to go through our design process, which started with a concept phase, excuse me. Um, so we did a, a very rapid ideation to think about uh, possible solutions, approaches, and features that might respond to some of the, the insights that we generated during that research phase. And then we came up with three interaction models that had three very different approaches to um, the kind of perspective, the, the, the unique perspective of the potential app that we were designing. And then through a process of, of iteration, we uh, refined the models, 
uh, and then moved into developing low fidelity prototypes. Um, so our prototyping process um, use both low fidelity paper prototypes as well as high fidelity clickable prototypes on low cost smartphones. So we actually bought a low cost, a, a very cheap smartphone in the Pakistani market and utilized that during our prototype testing with customers. And our prototype testing really focused on um, activities, so task-based prototyping to see how users were, were likely going to use the app, where they got stuck what aspects of the app worked well, uh, et cetera. Um, so the first output from this work was this discovery report, which highlights all of the insights from the research. And like I mentioned, that is available um, online. So um, feel free to, uh, to take a look at that. Um, I'm going to skip through the competitive audit because it's available online. Um, but just so that you guys see, we came out with um, a number of learnings from different apps around the world that helped us understand what, what's working and what's not working so well in the mobile money or financial services smartphone app space. The same is true for the uh, stakeholder interviews. I just want to focus on a couple of the user interviews that we found particularly relevant for our work. Um, so one of the insights that came out of our user research was that alternative uses of mobile money services are not made salient to customers, causing many people to limit their usage to one service. So as an example, when mobile money is introduced to new customers for a particular purpose, like um, you have a relative that lives in a different city and you want to be able to send that relative money, it seemed very rare in our research that people would ever use mobile money for something other than that first primary use. So one of our goals in our design work was to figure out how to make other uses of mobile money more salient for customers, more top of mind, more easily discoverable. Um, we also wanted to figure out ways to highlight the various uses of mobile money in the user interface design. In Pakistan currently, um, some of the providers have upwards of 15, 20 different services that they offer on mobile money. And they're really interested in figuring out how to get customers to use more of those services rather than just focusing on sending and receiving money. So we wanted to really find ways in our design, our smartphone app design, to highlight those additional uses. Um, I'm going to skip this one and go to this third finding, which I think is particularly important. So trust came out, not surprisingly, as a very critical aspect um, in people's experiences with mobile money and in the likelihood that they would use mobile money independently. Um, and especially because in Pakistan, the over-the-counter services are so robust and they've actually been developed as a business line for, uh, by the mobile money providers. Um, it's been difficult to get people to use mobile money independently. So if people know that the agent is willing and able to conduct a transaction for them, they oftentimes just stay with that service because it's lower risk. If something goes wrong, the agent can fix it. Um, and there's this behavior called satisficing in behavioral science um, that basically tells us that because using an agent works good enough as is, there's very little incentive for customers to try and use mobile money independently. So we needed to figure out ways in our design how to make the independent use of mobile money more enticing than over the counter and also how to make the benefits of using mobile money more top of mind, more salient, so that non-users are able to envision themselves using it easily. So people, we needed to figure out how to get over this trust aspect, this distrust aspect I should say, um, using clever uh, visual and friendly uh, designs in the smartphone app. Um, the last finding I just wanted to highlight before I pass it over to actually the, the designs themselves, which is why I know what everyone's more interested in seeing, is that we found that customers who did and independently use mobile money services were much more likely to use it again. So that first time experience mattered a great deal for future uses. 
this became particularly important because we, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time in our design work thinking about what should the first time use of this mobile money service be like for customers. How can we perhaps coach new customers during their first time use? How can we really leverage the smartphone interface to make it a very user friendly, <coughs> excuse me, user friendly, comfortable, easy, informative experience? Um, and you'll see in the, uh, in the final designs uh, what our approach to that was. Um, but this became a really important insight for us throughout the design process. So just to wrap up from the user interviews, where we decided to focus uh, in our design work definitely was on the onboarding experience, as I just mentioned. We also really wanted to think through the usability and desirability of key flows. Um, as I mentioned also, the first time use for key transactions, how can we really make that as easy and user friendly as possible? And then also focusing on which features and benefits of, of mobile money should we try and bring top of mind for customers? So how can we move people beyond just that obvious use case of sending and receiving money? Um, as I mentioned, the, the ask that we had was to focus on lower literate, lower income, and female users. What we ended up doing, because we, we also wanted to make sure that whatever we were designing would be useful and relevant for the providers, um, we ended up really focusing on what we call the mass market. So we wanted to design something that definitely worked to include the currently excluded customers, low literate, low income women, but we also wanted to make sure that we weren't designing something specifically for them. We really wanted to design something that would be um, appropriate and desirable for those excluded individuals, but at the same time be appropriate and desirable um, by the higher income, higher literate, um, even perhaps male users that, that are already using mobile money. So where we ended up was really focusing on that middle, if you think of a bell curve, kind of the, the bulge of the bell curve, um, the average user, the mass market. Um, but I think we made a few design choices that really catered to that low income, low literate, and female population as well. Let me, um, Adam, maybe um, we can pass over, I think I can pass over the um, <clears throat> presenting to you, or maybe Ed can do that. I don't know that I can. Okay. Um, Adam, you should have the controls now, so. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, your screen's Great. visible. Mm -hmm. Adam, you might want to just jump to um, the final output. I don't know, whatever you, whatever you think. So, uh, just double checking again. You see my screen now? Uh, no, it, it went off. Uh, Adam, sometimes when you go to presentation mode, it switches okay. off, so that might that might be what happens. And how about now? Is this better? Nope. Uh, yeah, nothing yet for me either, Adam. Now, now, now we see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to quickly revisit this page that Alex showed you before. Um, so <clears throat> our concept phase started with ideation. So coming out of that research phase, we had these how might we statements that Alex shared some examples of. How might we make the other features more salient? We used those statements to, jet, to drive our brainstorming sessions and to generate a number of feature ideas that we thought would address the research findings. With all those different feature ideas, we started to assemble what we called interaction models. So we identified three interaction models that we thought were viable solutions for this mobile money app um, that responded to the research findings we had. So the first interaction model was what we called the activity feed. And that was allowing people to interact with their contacts and make transactions through an activity feed that 
would look similar to a lot of the social media apps that a lot of our research participants were using. So someone could initiate a transaction by looking at the, their, their list of recent activity. Um, we thought that was a, a way for, to give people a very familiar interface and allow them to quickly access the people that they transact with most often. Another interaction model was called um, the, the, the virtual agent. This was the idea that someone would get a guided experience through the app and we would use the mobile money agent as a metaphor for giving them that experience. And then the third model was um, more based around the traditional USSD menu where the, the app is characterized by a static set of options. And the idea was that this would be kind of a small stepping stone from moving from USSD to the smartphone interface. And it would be a very simple, very static experience. So we had these three different models. We worked with our partners to narrow it down to two. And when we went into the prototyping phase, we had these two models. And the goal of that prototyping phase was to identify which model um, worked the best for our target users. So if I just, if I visit this page again that shows our prototype methodology, we started with some very, very low fidelity activities where we had hand-drawn sketches on paper. And we were uh, using that as a way to facilitate conversations with our research participants to show them, to show them different ideas and have them articulate and, dis and be able to describe what they wanted to see from this app. As we increased the fidelity of the solutions, we started showing them paper interfaces and again getting um, feedback about which model was the most appropriate for them. And then we increased the, the fidelity even further. We started creating more detailed wireframes. We put these on a phone. People could start clicking, pressing buttons, and actually going through the experience of using this app and of making a transaction. So that was how we went through that prototyping process. Now I'll jump ahead and show you what the final solutions that we came up with were. Um, so what you're seeing here are the high fidelity wireframes that were the output of this project. These are not final visual designs because our solution could be adopted by any number of mobile money or financial service providers. We didn't spend a lot of time thinking through the final visual design because we know that this would be an app that they would have to apply their own brand to. But we did spend a lot of time focusing on the design of icons because these were very culturally relevant to the market and we really wanted to make sure that the icons um, were symbols and images that people could understand and identify with. So, so what you're looking at is, again, high fidelity wireframes, but very intentional use of illustrations and icons. So what you're seeing on this screen is the home page or the home screen for this app after a user has logged in. Um, we chose the model that favors large buttons, static options, and a small set of key actions that a user is most likely to take. So the idea is let's focus the user on those key actions and let's keep this home screen very static. Every time they come visit it, they're gonna see more or less the same options. And part of the thinking of this is that for low literate or illiterate users, um, this would be a much more easy, easier interface for them to memorize. And we're, on this slide, we're highlighting the send money icon. So you could, that's just showing an example of how we made these icons large, detailed illustrations, um, and also very kind of literal representations. We're not using a lot of symbolism or metaphors. It's send money is an illustration of you know, someone handing money from one person to another. So trying to make them very literal um, in their meaning. Moving on to the next screen, um, the second key feature about this model was using personalized suggestions. So through our research, we got to understand that most mobile money users in Pakistan are only transacting with two or three or four people. So they're, they're, the people that they're sending and receiving money from is a very, very small group of people. So we wanted to make it very easy for someone to quickly repeat a transaction or quickly access um, a contact they've recently transacted with. So we're using 
some mechanisms in the interface to serve them these personalized suggestions based on previous activity. It's also a way for us to um, help them discover new features. So in this space where we're showing that people they've recently transacted with, we could also use the space to suggest new features that maybe we think they haven't quite understood yet. So if we see that someone has um, been using the service for many months but have not use it to pay the bill yet, we might use the space to say, hey, did you know that you could use this service to pay your bills? Because uh, again, one of our research findings is that everyone understands that you could use mobile money to send and receive money from friends and family, but a lot of people weren't aware that these other services even existed. Moving on to the next slide, um, we're showing one of the other key features, which is Can you guys still hear Adam? Uh, up until the last second, Alec. Yeah, here. Adam, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Hello, hello. Adam, we lost your vault. Your. I'm just gonna Skype him quickly. Oh, shoot. Um, sorry guys, give us one second. Technical challenge. Yeah, no worries, Alex. Hmm. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, just place them in the chat and we'll get them addressed by Adam and Alex towards the end of the the webinar. So, um, yeah. So I see. Um, so Mark, the presentation is stuck. Are you seeing personalized suggestions still? Slide thirty-seven. Yeah, that's what I see too. Yeah, I think he might have just had a connection issue. Um, he looks still online, which is funny. Oh, it's, yeah, it says offline now, so hopefully he'll be back on in a moment, okay. Alex. So. Yeah, so maybe we just pause for a moment. Does anyone have any questions so far, either about the research process or at least the app overview until now? <laughs> yeah, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll unmute you. So. So Adam just texted me. He's he's logging back in. Hi, this is James. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, James. How are you? Hi. I guess you know one of the things that I hope um, people are taking away from this is this methodology is broadly applicable to some of the other UI work that people are doing around you know, self-service applications that people are developing now, but also broadly to the UIs that field officers use um, and the innovations that, that some of the companies on the phone are, are trying to work on. They may not necessarily be working on mobile money specifically, but I think a lot of the approaches and design uh, thinking is, is, is broadly applicable. So I, I hope people are sort of getting that, uh, you know, that sort of pivot in, in this Absolutely. Yeah, and, and just to maybe piggyback off of James's comment that we use this same methodology in almost all of our projects. So whether it's service design or um, UX, UI design, or actually designing a financial product itself, the exact same methodology of doing behavioral research, concepting, prototyping, doing prototype testing with users. It's the same methodology we, we follow for all of our product, service, experience, design work. So we're sharing with you just this one UI UX uh, project, but uh, the methodology can be used much more broadly. And there was um, one question. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah, we can hear you again, uh, Adam. And there was one question from Uya, uh, Alex, for you that you know, dovetails well with what you were just saying. So. Yeah, and, and can I sort of hop on, hop on just one last point here? Um, 
which is um, if you could share maybe some of the stories of some of the geeks that saw the designs and sort of had that moment of, oh, I, I get it. I should have done X. And I'll drop off now. Take your answer. <laughs> um, so just to read out the question for everyone. So Uya asked, is there an impact if, in the UI if it is developed by geeks only without the input of experts of social behavior? Um, so that's, I love that question. That's hilarious, actually. And uh, Uya, write to me where you're based also. I'm just curious where people are sitting. Um, um, so I, you don't necessarily need in Nairobi. Great. We should totally meet next time we're in Nairobi, Uya. Um, I don't think that you necessarily need a... Uh, when, I, when you say social behavior, I'm assuming you mean like a behavioral researcher or behavioral designer. I don't think necessarily you need that on the team. The most important aspect of this methodology and the reason that we feel really confident in where we landed with the design and one of the reasons that the Pakistani market is quite excited about the final design is that we included end users and agents in both the research, so the generation of insights, as well as in the prototype testing process. So yes, the app was being designed by Adam and our team of Pakistani designers, um, but more importantly than that is that Adam and the team and, and myself were using and relying on the feedback and insights of end users and agents. And that's the most important critical step in this process. Me being a behavioralist certainly adds it's like a nice to have, but it's not necessarily a need to have. Um, but the, the need to have from our perspective is that we really rely on um, feedback and input from end users and agents and, and providers themselves as well, I should say. So Uya, let me know if that answered your question. Um, otherwise, we can, we can definitely come back to that. Um, but it sounds like, Adam, you're back if you want to pick up where you were. Or not. Adam, you there? Hmm. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you, Alex. And Adam should, yeah, he's unmuted, so hopefully we should be able to hear him. He looks like he's online. Okay. Adam, are you there? All right. Well, um, Ed, why don't you um, send the um, presentation back to me because I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, I made you present it once more, Alex. So. Okay, and I'll just pick it up, and um, I, I won't unfortunately do as good of a job as uh, as Adam would have, but um, you know I was participating, so <laughs> um, let me just open up the uh, the deck one more time, guys. Hold on one sec. Um, okay, show screen. So can you guys see the deck again? Yep, it's visible. Great. Um, so I'll just pick up, I think, where Adam was going. So I, I think he mentioned this contextual help feature, um, but I'll just, I'm going to pick up here because that's where my brain is at at the moment. Um, we really focused on um, coming up with um, a way, so this kind of live assistant, if you will. It's not actually live, it's all coded. Oops, sorry. Um, but this idea that you've got a, an assistant who kind of mimics the, um, the agent in an over-the-counter transaction, the, the app assistant can mimic that kind of support and help throughout the app. Um, so the assistant can be hidden and or unhidden uh, depending on the user's fluency in using mobile money. Um, so for very experienced mobile money users, they can completely ignore the assistant if they want to. So it's not an intrusion. Um, but for people who are wanting more guidance and support, um, they're able to unhide that assistant and the assistant will provide in-context support without interrupting the current task. One of the things that most frustrates us about some of the help features on other apps around the world is that you have to like exit your transaction to then go seek either an FAQ or a help section in the app. We wanted to try and make the help support feature built into the transaction so that you don't disrupt your transaction. You can continue on in your transaction. Um, the, there was also a question around language use in Pakistan because obviously Pakistanis speak uh, primarily Urdu. 
Urdu is a, um, a right to left read language. English obviously is a left to right language. So we designed the app so that it can be switched between English and Urdu, but the default language is in English. Um, we were actually quite surprised by this. We expected to design the app primarily in Urdu, um, but we found that because smartphones are very aspirational in Pakistan still, even among higher literate, higher income individuals, smartphones are still a, a kind of a luxury good, that people expected apps to be offered in English. Um, so we ended up designing the app primarily in English with this feature that you can switch to Urdu, but we decided not to switch from left to right to right to left. Um, so instead of mirroring the app, we kept the app uh, format and, and, and design in an English left to right um, design, but the, um, the text could be translated into, um, into Urdu. So we just got a question from Javier. For the contextual help, is needed any minimum hardware requirement? You know, I'm probably not the best person to answer that, but my understanding is no. It would be um, a feature developed and designed in the app. Um, we weren't using a chatbot. There was no kind of interactive nature to the, um, to the support. Uh, it was really just pre-coded contextual support. And Adam is texting me, which means he probably has something that he wants me to say. He says, that's correct. Good. I'm glad I got that right. <laughs> um, so there's no, there's no kind of complicated um, additional features. It's really just hard-coded information that um, would be available uh, along the transaction flow. But great question, Javier. Thank you. Um, so just in the interest of time, I think I'm going to um, just show a couple of the transaction flows. But I really want to open this up to questions and answers and have a conversation around how this might be applicable into the work that all of you are doing. Um, so I'll just show, um, we've got these primary use cases, onboarding and first time use, sending and receiving, help and support, and then marketing. I'm going to talk you through the onboarding and first time use because I think this is one of the, I mean, visually it's one of the most interesting parts of the app. Um, but also the first time use and onboarding were um, very critical um, transaction, or sorry, um, use cases that we, uh, that we focused on because our research showed that those first time uses were so critical for people. Um, so just to highlight a couple of things on this onboarding and first time use, use case. Um, we decided to use a storytelling approach um, that our goal was to really help people envision how they themselves could engage with mobile money and become aware of features that they might not know about. Um, so we used a um, kind of a storytelling approach where Noor is this woman, um, and you'll see her more clearly in this next, uh, this next slide. Noor is a woman um, who looks like a kind of an average Pakistani woman. Um, originally we had Noor sitting in kind of a, a mountain um, outdoor rural landscape because we were trying to show that mobile money can be used anywhere in Pakistan, even in the most rural places. And the feedback we got from users during our prototype testing, especially from women users, female users, was actually you should show her in her house, like in a city, because that's the most, like that's the most value add for us, that we could just be home sending and receiving money or paying our bills or doing other kinds of types of transactions. So we then iterated and designed this onboarding story to, uh, to show Noor in her home rather than in a faraway land. Um, the, um, the onboarding process also um, included a set of messages from that help feature that um, was very personalized and tried to help the customer feel very comfortable. Um, so at, in this example that we're showing you, a user's logging in for the first time and the person has no balance in their account. Um, so then the assistant, that help feature, is suggesting that the user go and find a shop so that she can um, put money into her account, for example. And the button that is highlighted is locate shop to try and help the person find a shop closest to her. Um, let me pause there. Um, I just want to maybe highlight and give you a little bit of a zoom in on um, 
some of the visual language that we used. So um, on the bottom right of the slide, you're seeing some of the icons that we tested with users, very flat icons. These actually were um, more difficult for customers to understand. We also had tested out a horizontal tab menu, uh, which we found that, that users found also more difficult to discover and understand. So these um, highly illustrated, dynamic, multicolor uh, buttons, icons, were where we ended up landing because it was much easier for customers to use and, and discover. Um, let me just move forward a little bit. And again, we're going to send you links to these decks so that you have access to all of it. And we tried to make this deck um, very uh, explanatory so that you have the rationale on every slide for why we made certain decisions. So let me just move forward. And Adam, I saw your text to me, and I will read that out in just a moment. So where we landed um, was, and I think Ed mentioned this in the introduction, we tried to design what we call a design toolkit. So this toolkit has been made available. It's public, so anyone around the world can use it. The purpose of it was to provide um, a set of transaction flows, visual language, so those visual icons, as well as um, language and framing, actual like the, the written messages, uh, the text, to any provider who is interested in developing a smartphone app for mobile money. The idea is that this toolkit can be parsed out and providers can choose as something as specific as a particular icon or as integrated as all of the transaction flows. So it's not an app that we've fully developed and designed so that um, a, a, a provider can like plug and play. We really wanted to design a toolkit that has a variety of different resources and options within it that providers can pick and choose from depending on their target segments, the apps they've already designed and developed, et cetera. And where we currently are in the Pakistani market is that one of the two largest uh, mobile money providers, Mobi Cash, uh, Jazz Cash, Mobi Link, which is now, it was called Mobi Cash, now it's called Jazz Cash. They are actually um, redesigning their app and using our transaction flows, our uh, visual language, and our suggestions. Uh, and then one of the banks that is uh, providing mobile money services or beginning to provide mobile money services in the market um, will be designing their app using a number of these recommendations in this toolkit as well. And Karin does as a, um, as a financial inclusion organization is <clears throat> interesting in supporting other providers, banks and telcos, in applying some of these insights, these recommendations, these resources to their uh, the development of their smartphone mobile money apps as well. Um, but again, this, this is a public good, so really anyone around the world can access it. We wouldn't recommend, obviously, using the visual language that we've designed because it is tailored for the Pakistani market. But I do think that a lot of the insights and um, the learnings from this process are very relevant to multiple markets around the world. And I'll just stop by reading out a comment that Adam sent me on, on text that he wanted to respond. Um, there was a question earlier about um, what the geeks were surprised by, uh, and Adam wanted to say the following. I would say that we tested a lot of the icons, such as help and close, that the geeks were using in their apps and found that none of the users understand what the symbols meant. So um, I'm not sure if it's in this deck. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, one of the things that Adam is referring to is uh, an example the, that a lot of the geeks use this, um, this X here for cancel. We use that, we tested that X in a number of different use cases. In this case here, the X for cancel worked fine. People understood that X meant cancel or, or exit. We also tested that X um, for a dialog box that popped up that had uh, information in it. I'm see, trying to see if I can find an example of that. Um, when the dialog popped up um, and we wanted, um, here we go. We wanted uh, to say, for example, okay, great, your transfer was complete. And then we wanted people to hit that X to close that dialog box. Participants did not know that the X meant close. Um, so 
because a lot of users in Pakistan weren't using desktop, desktop, desktop computers for the last 20, 30 years, uh, and that X really comes from a desktop computer uh, interface, they, they didn't understand all of the different uses of the X. So we tested down to very specific icons uh, and features such as this X, and our, our prototype testing really led us to understand how customers use and understand very specific features and elements. And that's why this prototype testing with users is so critical. Um, so I think that was one of the things that was most surprising to us. Um, we also, um, the same can be true for the next and the back buttons, how to move forward. All of these learnings are shared in this deck um, and in some of the resources on the microsite that we will share with you. Um, but I think this is a great example of why prototype testing with users is so critical. We take a lot of these features for granted as the geeks, as the designers, um, and these things just aren't understood and utilized by all users around the world. So let me just pause there and see, are there any questions or reflections, comments, anything from, from the group? And I'll just unmute everybody and then, you know, leave the ground open for, for questions, so. Okay, so the floor is open now for any questions you might have for Alex or Adam, so please uh, share any that you have. And we'd also love to hear reflections like, is this kind of work or work that you all are doing? How might it be relevant? So Uya sent a, a question. How do you make a trade-off between experienced users and naive users in design to ensure a balanced design framework. Oh, ooh, yeah, I can't wait to meet you in person. I'm so excited. Um, so the way that we do that is in our recruitment process of who we are both doing our research with and then who we're doing user testing with. So um, we follow a very, um, well, I would say we, we follow two kind of methodologies, two approaches to this. One is a very traditional human-centered design approach and one is a behavioral approach. So the, the human-centered design approach um, really forces us to uh, recruit what we call extreme end users. So novice and fluent, um, non-users and kind of super users, uh, and then also average users. So in our recruitment process, both in research and in design testing, um, we're always recruiting a very diverse group of individuals to test the app and give us insights. Um, the behavioral approach um, leads us to do what we call behavioral segmentation. So we do recruiting less focused on like demographic um, recruiting, like age, gender, income, et cetera, although we definitely take those things, things into consideration. We, we do a behavioral segmentation which really focuses on people's uh, use cases or, or their, their user behavior. So again, are they novice users? Have they never used mobile money before? Great, we love interviewing non-users. They tell us really interesting things about how our app works or doesn't work or how our products and services work or does, don't work. Um, we definitely wanna uh, interview and spend time with uh, super users, extreme end users. Um, so we, we take more of a, a use case, behavioral segmentation approach and also really focus on those extreme ends. Even though we're designing for the average user, we need to understand what those extreme tails look like, and that helps us get there. Yeah, Alex, I could add one thing to that, too. Oh, awesome. welcome back. Great, yes. <laughs> um, I, I think that's just an interesting question because before we started this project, one of the hypotheses that our client had was that we might need to create separate experiences for lower literate users and a separate experience for more advanced users. And we quickly learned that that wasn't the right solution. We didn't want to alienate a low income user because the smartphone and by extension smartphone apps were such aspirational things. No one wanted to, felt, no one wanted to feel like they were using something designed for a less educated person. 
so that definitely became one of the challenges. How do we make design an interface that serves all these uh, different users and different needs? Awesome. So Mark asked a question, and maybe Adam, you can just you can now that you've got sound back, you can respond to this one. How did you test user scenarios, and how did you assist the users during the process? So when we did our prototype testing, um, we would give the user different tasks and see how they would try to achieve that task. Um, so for example, we would tell the user, pretend that you want to send $5 to John Smith. They would then have to take our prototype and try to navigate through the app and achieve that task. And we would observe them doing that. We would encourage them to think out loud as they were going through that process so that we are able to understand what their thought process is, what, what they're looking at on the screen, what they think the different options are. Um, and if people got stuck, we would kind of let them get stuck. We would see how they would try to get unstuck. You know, and eventually if someone just felt like became too frustrated, then we would give them hints or tell them what we thought the right solution was. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. I'm not, maybe I didn't understand that right. No, that's, I think that's right. So it was very task-based, Mark, very task-based. So one more question, Adam. Um, thanks for the presentation. Super useful. How do we address a situation? Oops, I lost the question. How do we address a situation where a single device may be shared among multiple users, for example, a family, with different needs? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that was definitely a use case. Um, and actually, like this, I'm just going to give an example, and this kind of ties back to one of the previous questions about designing something that was both for advanced users and novice users. So for example, we did interview a shopkeeper who was a pretty savvy smartphone user. And this person clearly didn't need the help of the assistant. So we asked them, like, would you prefer to not have the assistant? Do you think that this might get in your way? Um, and he said, no, keep the assistant, because sometimes I give my phone to the boy that works in my shop to do transactions for me, and that boy might benefit from having the help of the assistant. Now, I think your question is more about what if different family members with different mobile money accounts are sharing the same phone, and I think that's there's a lot of technical considerations in that because an account is tied to a phone number. There isn't the notion of like logging out and switching accounts. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's your question or how to answer that, or Alex, if you have any additional comments about that specifically. I think you got it, yeah, for sure. Um, so then we also have from Tarun. Um, wait, I lost it, sorry. Um, did you also incorporate the specially abled people, like visually impaired people as well? Any guidelines for that? Want to take that one, Adam? We did not focus. Yeah, we didn't focus on making the app accessible for people with disabilities. That was just sort of, in some ways, outside the scope of this project. But of course, we wanted to, to the best of our ability, not exclude anyone. And a lot of the participants we had were women, were older women who did have. Um, you know, vision impairment problems or whose hands might not have been as dexterous as the average user. So that definitely led us to make design decisions around having larger buttons, larger font sizes, reducing the amount of text on a screen. Um, no. So I think just through our recruitment, we met people with a range of physical abilities and the, the final designs address those, but we didn't get specifically into mm -hmm. um, accessibility and features. No one can add to that, which is our, we didn't talk about this, but the app does have an yeah. audio function. So um, the, the help, the contextual help feature, the assistant, she can be read out loud uh, in either English or in Urdu. Um, so that's, that's a feature that might help visually impaired, um, but it wasn't a use case. It wasn't a persona that we specifically targeted. 
Um, I'm just um, conscious of time because Adam and I do have a hard stop in two minutes, and there are a number of questions. So we may not get to everything, but we can certainly follow up on email. I apologize. Um, I just wanted to see if there was anything specifically for Adam that might make sense. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, Adam, did we come up with user personas? If yes, what are the uh, attributes that are used to define a user persona? You want to take that one real quick? Sure. Um, so in a lot of our projects, we do use personas as a research synthesis tool. And we run a research and create these composite characters that become to communicate our research findings and become personas that we design for. We did not do that in this project. Um, I think that our, I think everyone, our client and our partners had a pretty good idea of who we were designing for, so I, I don't think we felt like that was a super valuable tool in the process, but in other projects that Alex and I have worked on, we definitely use personas, and we um, use those as a vehicle to kind of synthesize the research and then share those and communicate those with partners and clients. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. So um, what I would love to, thank you, Uya, for the nice message. Um, what I'd love to do, if it's okay with everyone, there's about three or four questions that we didn't get to. If it's okay, um, Ed, maybe Adam and I can take those questions and, and respond to them in email and then share that with you, and perhaps you could share that out with the group. Would that be an okay way to handle those questions? Yeah, that's perfect, Alex. So, no, thank you, uh, both you and Adam, for all your time today. And, you know, this has been really beneficial, and we're looking forward to sharing the microsite and the research findings uh, after the webinar. And I've recorded this as well, so I'll send the, the screencast to others, too. So. Great. And I'm just copying down the questions that we could have to on. I do want to say that Adam and I are happy to have any follow-on conversations. Um, if, um, if anyone wants to reach out to us, Ed has our emails. We're also on social media, so please feel free to reach out. Um, if there's anything we didn't get to that you've got further questions on. Yeah, and we'd love to have you or Adam, Alex, in the future at any, you know, conferences or events we might be hosting where we bring our community together, where you could lead, you know, sessions where you go over these principles and best approaches to doing this type of research and prototyping. Happy to do it, especially for a group of individuals that, um, you know, I think we all on this call share a kind of a common vision for um, creating products and services that really work for, for marginalized individuals. So anything we can do to support that community, we're happy to do. So we really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your days and evenings. I know it's late where some of you are, so much appreciated for the time and, and for the really wonderful questions. We're, we're happy to be here with all. Okay. Thank you again, Alex, and thank you everybody for attending today, and thank you once again to, to James for bringing Alex and Adam here. And, Closing the idea of this great session. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll have, have a good day. Good morning. Your next community meeting will be in a little bit of time. We'll have our public developer okay. meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care.